Bada bing, bada boom. Hey everybody, this is your buddy Carl for the late edition of the Daily Bible Reading on July the 7th. Let's dive right in. So July the 7th, we are doing what? The Book of Chronicles, first Book of Chronicles. And I know it's a lot of genealogy, so just hang in there. It's just kind of click it off. This is like legal documents of tribal history. So, all right, we have picked it up at First Chronicles chapter 4, now on to verse 5. We're going to go right there. Remember, we were there at the descendants of Hur, the firstborn of Ephrathah, the ancestor of Bethlehem. So we are getting this genealogy in light of that. And moving on, verse 5, Ashur, the father of Tekoa, and had two wives named Hila and Nara. Nara gave birth to Ahuzam, Hefer, Damini, Hahashtari, Hila, Gave, oh, sorry. And then Hila, the other wife, gave birth to Zareth, Is, Isar, Ithnan, and Kaz, who became the ancestor of Anub, Zobibab, and all the families of Aharahel, son of Harum. So there you go. There was a, na a man named Jabez. Remember Jabez, the prayer of Jabez. We're going to see that. A man named Jabez, who was more honorable than all of his brothers. Now look, we've gone through all of these genealogies. And if you've followed any Christian book, popular books in recent years, what? The prayer of Jabez became huge. In the midst of all of these, you know, legal standings and, you know, bloodline documents, now you've got a man named Jabez who is more honorable than any of his brothers. That's a key word, more honorable than any of his brothers. His mother named him Jabez because his birth had been so painful he was the one who prayed to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and expand my territory. Please be with me in all that I do and keep me from all trouble and pain. And God granted him his request. So you think, man, what a powerful thing. He prayed this to God and God granted it. Oh, that you would bless me. This is First Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10. He is the one, Jabez, who prayed the prayer, and he's remembered for that. So it had to be documented, something that he probably spoke out loud, and people came to know him for this prayer. How about that? So it gained him fame, just people thinking, this man of God, Jabez, is serious about the Lord. And God granted him his request, oh, that, I'm going to read it again, oh, that you would bless me and expand my territory. This is a great prayer. We can pray this. Please be with me in all that I do and keep me from all trouble and pain. And God grant, there you go. So that's what he prayed and then God granted it. How about that? God answers prayer. That's all I'm going to say. So consider that. If that is a highlight of one thing of First Chronicles, the prayer of Jabez nails it. Okay, moving on. Verse 11, back to genealogies. Caleb, the brother of Shua, was the father of Mahir. Mahir was the father of Eshton. Eshton was the father of Beth Rapha, Pasia, and Tahinan. Or sorry, ta, uh, Tahina. Tahina was the father of Ir Nahash. These were the descendants of Rika. The sons of Kenaz were Otheniel and Seriaha. Otheniel's sons were Hathoth. How about that? Hathoth. Yes, two THs in that name, if you're reading it. Isn't that amazing? And Mionothai. Mionothai was the father of Ophrah. Saraiah was the father of Joab, the founder of the Valley of Craftsmen. How about that? Not craftsmen, tools. They were actual people that built. They did things with their hands. The Valley of Craftsmen, so-called because they were craftsmen. Be like the Valley of Musicians or the, the Town of Bakers, right? There you go. Moving on. So they were the craftsmen. The sons of Caleb, son of Japhuna, were Iru, Elah, and Naim. The son of Elah was Kanaz. The sons of Jahalalel were Zif, Zipha, Teriah, and Asarel. The sons of Ezra were Jether, Mered, Ephor, and Jolan. One of Mered's wives became the mother of Miriam, Shammai, and Ishba, the father of Ishtamoah. 
he married a woman from Judah who became the mother of Jared, the father of Gedor, Heber, the father of Soka, and Jekuthiel, the father of Zanoah. Mered also married Bethia, a daughter of Pharaoh, and she bore him children. How about that? Okay. Uh, moving on. Hodiah's wife was the sister of Naham. One of her sons was the father of Kilah, the Garmite, and another was the father of Eshtimoa, the Machmite, or Machathite, sorry. The sons of Shimon were Amnon, Rina, Ben Hanan, and Telon. The descendants of Ishi were Soheth and Ben Zoheth. Shelah was one of Judah's sons. The descendants of Shelah were Ur, the father of Leka, Leda, the father of Maharsha, the families of the families of linen workers. Here you go, workers at Beth Hashabia, Jochim, the men of Koziba, and Joash and Seraph, who ruled over Moab and Jeshubi Lahem. These names all come from ancient records. <laughs> well, First Chronicles is a pretty ancient record, but here we go. They were the pottery makers who lived in Natame and Gadara. They lived there and worked for the king. The sons of Simeon were Jemuel, Zem Jamin, Jarib, Zohar, and Shaul, or Shaul, like Paul, S-H-A-U-L. The descendants of Shaul were Shalom, Mibsam and Mishma. The descendants of Mishma were Hamuel, Zakur, and Shimei. Shimei. Shimei had 16 sons and 6 daughters. Wow, that's a family. But none of his brothers had large families, so he did. So Simeon's tribe never grew as large as the tribe of Judah. That's an interesting note, how that came to pass. They lived in Beersheba, Moloda. Hazar Shual, Bilha, Ezem, Tolad, Bethuel, Horma, and Ziglag, Beth Mar Koboth, Hazur Susiim, and Beth Beri, and Sharem. These towns were under their control until the time of King David. Wow. Their descendants also lived in Etam, E Ain, Ramon, Token, and Ashen, five towns and their surrounding villages as far away as Balath. This was their territory, and these names are listed in their genealogical records. Other descendants of Simeon included Meshobab, Jemlek, Josha, son of Amaziah, Joel, Jehu, son of Joshibiah, son of Saraiah, son of Asiel, Elio Ene, Jacobath, Jesh Ohahe, Asahe, Adiel, Jesimiel, and Benaie, and Zizas, Ziza, son of Shiphai, son of Alon, son of Jadahai, son of Shimri, and son of Jamaliha. <laughs> These were the names of, by the way, I'll pause. I'm flying through the names. I'm just giving it my best shot. I don't know Hebrew and not sure of the English translation. So thank you for your patience. If I'm getting it wrong, at least you get the idea. Verse 38, these were the names of some of the leaders of Simeon's wealthy clans. Their families grew and they traveled to the region of Gerar. In the east part of the valley, seeking pasture land for their flocks, they found lush pastures there and the land was quiet and beautiful. That's lovely. I would love that. Some of Ham's descendants had been living in that region, but during the reign of King Hezekiah of Judah, these leaders of Simeon invaded the region and completely destroyed the homes of the descendants of Ham and of the Meunites. No trace of them remains today. Poor Ham. They killed everyone who lived there and took the land for themselves because they wanted its good pasture land for their flocks. 500 of these invaders from the tribe of Simeon went to Mount Seir, led by Pelatia, Naria, Raphaia and Uziel, all sons of Ishi. They destroyed the few Amalekites who had survived, and they have lived there ever since. So, strange, I know. When we read that, one side note thinking, it's funny how these tribes felt like you just had to kill people off. Couldn't you come and establish agreements or peaceful living together kind of thing? They just didn't do it that way. 
sad. Do we like it now? I can't imagine. We can't think of that. Like, why can't we just move into a region? Is there space for us to live? Can we purchase homes and land? Yeah, that's the way it is now in modern times. Even in our recent enough history, we know nations and tribes have fought for lands and rights forever. It's a sad, yes, it is a sad commentary on the fallen state of mankind. That throughout history, history we've shown ourselves unable to just cooperate and live in peace. May it get better in our lifetime. But the Lord has warned us about that. There will always be wars and rumors of wars. Moving on. So, July the 7th, chapter 5. We'll read on to verse 17. The oldest son of Israel was Reuben. Remember that? The 12 tribes of Israel, the elder, right? Reuben's the firstborn. He's the oldest one. But since he dishonored his father by sleeping with one of his father's concubines, his birthright was given to the sons of his brother Joseph. For this reason, Reuben is not listed in the genealogical records as the firstborn. Look at that. He had to pay the price by losing his status as the firstborn. The descendants of Judah became the most powerful tribe and provided a ruler for the nation. But the birthright belonged to Joseph. Well, there you go. Very key. That's a five-star paragraph in First Chronicles as you're going through genealogies. The sons of Reuben, the oldest son of Israel, were Hanak, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. The descendants of Joel were Shemaiah, Gog, Shemei, Mika, Ra, Reaiah, ba Baal, or Baal, like the god, but this is a person, B-A-A-L, and Bira. Bira was the leader of the Reubenites when they were taken into captivity by King Tiglath-Peleser of Assyria. Bira's relatives are listed in their genealogical records by their clans. Jael, a leader, Zechariah, and Bela, son of Azaz, son of Shema, son of Joel. The Reubenites lived in the area that stretches from Aurora to Nebo and Belmion, and since they had so many livestock in the land of Gilead, they spread east toward the edge of the desert that stretches to the Euphrates River. During the reign of Saul, the Reubenites defeated the Hagrites in battle. Then they moved into the Hagrite settlements all along the eastern edge of Gilead. Next to the Reubenites, the descendants of Gad lived in the land of Bashan as far east as Seleka. Joel was the leader in the land of Bashan, and Shepham was second in command, followed by Janai, or Janai and Shephat. Their relatives, the leaders of seven other clans, were Michael, Meshulam, Sheba, Jorai, Sekan, Zia, and Eber. These were all descendants of Abihail, son of Hurai, son of Jaroah, son of Gilead, son of Michael, son of Jeshahai, son of Joda, or Jado, sorry, son of Buz, B-U-Z. Ahi, son of Abdiel, son of Guni, was the leader of their clans. The Gadite, the Gadite lived in the land of Gilead, in Bashan and in its villages, and throughout all the pasture lands of Sharon. All of these were listed in the genealogical records during the days of King Jotham of Judah and King Jeroboam of Israel. Okay, we're going to pause for, for the daily reading. Hang on for the ride. The Chronicles just goes like this, although they do unpack more stories. July 7th, the psalm today is Psalm 5, verses 1 through 12. Eh, King David's writing again. The theme, the lies of enemies... God is able to defend us from lies spoken against us. King David writes, For the choir director, a psalm of David to be accompanied by the flute. How about that? A flute should play along with this. O oh Lord, hear me as I pray. Pay attention to my groaning. Listen to my cry for help, my King and my God. For I pray to no one but you. Listen to my voice in the morning, Lord. Each morning I bring my request to you and wait expectantly. O oh God, you take no pleasure in wickedness. You cannot tolerate the sins of the wicked. Therefore the proud may not stand in your presence, for you hate all who do evil. You will destroy those who tell lies. 
The Lord detests murderers and deceivers. Because of your unfailing love, I can enter your house. I will worship at your temple with deepest awe. Lead me in the right path, O Lord, or my enemies will conquer me. Make your way plain for me to follow. My enemies cannot speak a truthful word. Their deepest desire is to destroy others. Their talk is foul like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with flattery. O God, declare them guilty. Let them be caught in their own traps. Drive them away because of their many sins, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them sing joyful praises forever. Spread your protection over them, that all who love your name may be filled with joy. For you bless the godly, O Lord. You surrounded them with your shield of love. Yes, Lord, you do. That's awesome. All right, folks, July the 7th. We are in Proverbs 18, verse 19. One proverb today. An offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. Arguments separate friends like a gate locked with bars. Hmm. Yep. And I wrote that in the note. <laughs> yes, it's sad. Our arguments and quarreling with friends, it's hard to break that again. So be careful. Remember where the scriptures say, be slow to anger and slow to speak. A calm answer turns away wrath. Don't get into fights and feuds. Avoid it at all costs. You can discuss things. Don't get mean in battle. That's what, the, that's what it's warning us against. Yes, Lord, help us. All right. July the 7th. Today's reading is Acts chapter 25. All right. Here we are with Paul before Festus, right? Acts 25. Three days after Festus arrived in Caesarea to take over his new responsibilities, he left for Jerusalem where the leading priest and other Jewish leaders met with him and made their accusations against Paul. They asked Festus as a favor to transfer Paul to Jerusalem, planning to ambush and kill him on the way. Scoundrels. But Festus replied that Paul was at Caesarea and he himself would be returning there soon. So he said, those of you in authority can return with me. If Paul has done anything wrong, you can make your accusations. <clears throat> About eight or ten days later, Festus ret returned to Caesarea, and on the following day he took his seat in court and ordered that Paul be brought in. Now remember, Paul's been held there two years plus, right? Waiting for a hearing. Can you imagine that? Amazing. When Paul arrived, the Jewish leaders from Jerusalem gathered around and made many serious accusations they couldn't prove. Of course not, he didn't do them. Paul denied the charges. I'm not guilty of any crime against the Jewish laws or the temple or the Roman government. He said, then Festus, wanting to please the Jews, asked him, are you willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there? But Paul replied, no. This is the official Roman court, so I ought to be tried here. He knew he'd been held. Now he's getting straight forward. Like, I've been held here this long. This is a Roman court. Let's be done with this. I agree. You know very well I'm not guilty of harming the Jews. If I've done something worthy of death, I don't refuse to die. But if I'm innocent, no one has a right to turn me over to these men to kill me. I appeal to Caesar. Festus conferred with his advisors and then replied, Very well, you have appealed to Caesar, and to Caesar you will go. Look at that. Amazing. Now he's going to like the president. This is Caesar. Woo. A few days later, King Agrippa arrived with his sister Bernice to pay their respects to Festus. During their stay of several days, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. There's a prisoner here, he told him, whose case was left for me by Felix. When I was in Jerusalem, the leading priest and Jewish elders pressed charges against him and asked me to condemn him. I pointed out to them that Roman law does not convict people without a trial. They must be given an opportunity to confront their accusers and defend themselves. When his accusers came here for the trial, I didn't delay. I called the case the very next day and ordered Paul brought in. But the accusations made against him weren't uh, any of the crimes I expected. 
Instead, it was something about their religion and a dead man named Jesus. See, he doesn't even realize the resurrection. He hasn't heard the story. Get that? So the gospel is still being heard, right? That's pretty amazing. Wow. Who Paul insists is alive. I was at a loss to know how to investigate these things since I asked him whether he would be willing to stand trial on these charges in Jerusalem. But Paul appealed to have his case decided by the emperor. So I ordered that he be held in custody until I could arrange to send him to Caesar. I'd like to hear the man myself, Agrippa said. And Festus replied, you will tomorrow. So the next day, Agrippa and Bernice arrived at the auditorium with great pomp, accompanied by military officers and prominent men of the city. Festus ordered that Paul be brought in. Then Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are here, this is the man whose death is demanded by all the Jews, both here and Jerusalem. But in my opinion, he has done nothing to deserve death. However, since he appealed his case to the emperor, I have decided to send him to Rome. But what shall I write the emperor? For there is no clear charge against him, so I have brought him before all of you, and especially you, King Agrippa, so that after we examine him, I might have something to write, for it makes no sense to send a prisoner to the emperor without specifying the charges against him. All right, folks, we're going to pause there. This is a big story for Paul. All of these leaders and being held for so long. All right, there you go. That's the daily reading. May you be blessed, be encouraged, and we'll see you tomorrow for another daily Bible reading. Have a great night. Bye-bye.